Hello and welcome once again to the Perimeter Church Podcast. What's distinctive about Christianity? Is it simply a moral code? Or rituals? Or a philosophy of living? Or is there more to it? Teaching team member Caleb Click starts the new series, Glory of Christ, with this sermon entitled, The Glory of Christ Revealed, which covers John chapter 1, verses 14 to 18. For more information and to watch or hear other sermons, please visit our website at perimeter.org. Thank you for joining us today. Well, good morning, everybody. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open them up with me to John chapter 1. We're going to be spending our time this morning in verses 14 to 18 primarily, but we'll be bouncing around to some other places as well. And as you do this, you know, as Jimmy just said, we we are starting a new series this morning, uh, one entitled The Glory of Christ, uh, where we, for the next few weeks, we are going to be looking in a more focused and sustained way at who Jesus was and what it is that he has done. And the reason we're doing this is a simple one, because we are convinced that Christianity is not a culture to be put on. It's not a system to be adopted. Christianity is a person to be believed into. Herman Bovink, he puts it this way, He says, Christianity, the Christian faith, it's not a system, it's a person. Jesus, he's not the founder of the Christian faith, Jesus is the Christian faith. Jesus isn't just one who proclaims the gospel, Jesus himself is its very content. To be a Christian, It is to look on Jesus and say, you and you alone, you are the place where my life is found. And it is a reality that John proclaims in an astonishing way right here in John chapter one. Read with me here what it says. We'll read verses one to five for context, then 14 to 18 is where we'll spend our time. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people, his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me. He might have been born after me. His ministry might have started after me, but this is someone who is greater than I am. Why? Because he was before me. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law, the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. This is God's word. Let's pray. Gracious Father, Lord, would you take this text and would you unfold it in all of its depths so that, Lord, we as your people, we would see and know and believe in the one who is the light of the world and the life of men. Would you meet us now? Would you speak through my weakness And would the word that became flesh be the word that we now hear and the word that we now receive? Would you do this in the precious name of your son? 
Amen. Years ago, I stumbled on a documentary about a young man grappling with the death of his father. His dad's body had washed up on the shore of the Wicomico River. He had drowned in what looked on the surface like a routine boating accident. And as any child who's just faced the death of their parent, he was grappling with his father's legacy and asking himself that question, who was my dad? And on the surface, it was a tragic story. But what made this story exceptional was this one significant detail. This man's father, he was the ex-director of the CIA, a man named William Colby. And when William Colby died, all of a sudden, all of these secrets, all these things that were true of this man but had been hidden, all of these things started bubbling to the surface and suddenly this young man who thought he knew his father, who thought he knew the man who had raised him all those years growing up, suddenly he began to wonder if that was actually true. And where before, when people would come to him and they would say, your dad has done terrible things, he would always respond to them, you don't know my father. You don't know what he's like. You don't know what kind of person he is. I do. I know him. You can't say those kind of things now. With the stuff that was beginning to bubble to the surface, all this young man could say was the truth is, is I don't know. Because I didn't really know him. And the reason is this. My father didn't want me to. There were things about my father that he had hidden that he chose not to reveal. And so my father was a man that I never really knew. It's the struggle with every human relationship, isn't it? Because we can only know a person to the degree to which they want to be known. And even then, even if they want to be known in the fullest, the truth is we have to confess we, are, we know in our hearts we're only scratching the surface, aren't we? And that problem, that struggle that reveals himself in every human relationship, nowhere do we feel this more acutely than when it comes to our relationship with God. Because where with people there's frailty. There's this weakness, this powerlessness that leads us to reveal ourselves in moments where we get unguarded, where circumstances bring out that rage that maybe has been hiding in our heart and maybe we've been trying to push down and put away, but circumstances and stress suddenly bring it to the surface where we have these moments where we unintentionally reveal what is in our hearts. God, God possesses no such frailty. God possesses no such weakness. God never has an unguarded moment. As the one who has all power, there is never a moment when God unintentionally reveals something about himself to us. The only way that God can be known is if God himself intends for you to know him. And even, even if God desired to be known, we are faced with this fact that compounds this problem even more. How can we as finite creatures corrupted by the fall who can scarcely comprehend our spouses, who can't even agree on basic facts like is the earth round or flat? What makes us think we can comprehend the infinite and eternal God? So how can God be known? It's a problem we see everywhere. It doesn't matter where you go in human history. It doesn't matter what people you visit. Everywhere you go, you will see there is this universal religious impulse, this thing that Calvin calls our sense of divinity. And yet, while there's a universal religious impulse, there's not a universal religion, is there? There is this sense in every human heart that something is wrong that needs to be made right. That there is life that we need, that we can't seem to find, that we have to get, that we have to get our hands on. That there's some force, some power outside of ourselves that has to be dealt with. And yet, 
Despite the universality of that longing, none of us seem to be able to agree on what that is. Some people are looking for it through the doors of a brothel and others are looking for it in the courts of a temple. Some people think that they're gonna find it by ascending the corporate ladder and others think they will find it behind the walls of their home. Some people look outside of themselves, some people look within, but all that we ever really see, the only thing that we all seem to share in common is this, we, in our own power, we can't know. If God is to be known, it can't be left in our hands. Because in our own power and strength, we will never be able to find him. And in the end, whatever it is we end up worshiping, it will be something that is less than who he really is, some piece of this creation in this world. If God is to be known, even in part, God must make himself known. The Bible, the claim of the Bible is that there is a God who has done precisely that. A God who doesn't demand that we find our way to him, but who in mercy and in kindness, he comes down to us. And he makes himself known so that the life we crave would be life that we have. And he is a God who has brought that revelation to fulfillment in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And this is the astonishing claim of our verses today. It is that the words and deeds of God, they are seen in the words and the deeds of a poor Galilean carpenter. And if that's not true, then this isn't a book to be entertained. This isn't a book to get some useful teaching from. This book is blasphemous and it should be rejected with violence. But if it's true, then here's a reality to be embraced with all our heart and soul and mind and strength because here is the life for which we were made. As Jesus says in John 17, this is eternal life, that they would know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Why? Because in a world cloaked in darkness, in a world where God can only be known as far as he chooses to reveal himself, Jesus Christ, he is the revelation of the glory of God, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And if we're gonna understand the full depths of what John is saying here, we have to go back into the history of Israel to a moment when God revealed himself to this man named Moses in Exodus 33 to 34. You know, the story of the Bible is the story of a God who is progressively revealing himself to his people. In some ways, it's like the relationship between a child and their parent. Where as a kid, you have one sense of who your parents are, and then as you grow older and more and more comes to the surface, you have a deeper and deeper sense of what they are really like and who they really are in the core of their person. The difference is that unlike your parents, God doesn't change. And unlike your parents, God doesn't unintentionally reveal himself, and so what we are seeing in the scriptures, it is the progressive unfolding of newer and deeper depths of God himself. God making himself known more and more and more to his people and the most profound moment of revelation in all the Old Testament, it is right here in Exodus 33 to 34. A passage that John is deliberately evoking here in a way we're going to see. And here's the context. God has redeemed his people from slavery in Egypt. He has freed them from Pharaoh. He has brought them through the Red Sea and into the wilderness. He's provided for them food from heaven and water from a rock. And in the chapters right before this text, God in a covenant ceremony, he has married himself to his people. He has said, I am your God and you are my people and nothing is ever going to change that reality. And right here in that moment, Moses ascends Mount Sinai where the glory of God has descended on the top of the mountain to receive from God's hands 
the revelation of his promises and his instructions for his people. It is a moment of incredible, momentous grace. And yet right here, Israel does the thing they do over and over again. And we, as other as human beings, we continuously do over and over again. Israel rebels. They make a golden calf and they bow down and they worship it. And on the very night of their wedding to God, they commit adultery. And God, as any husband would be in that moment, God gets angry. And he threatens first to destroy his people completely. And when he relents from that, he threatens to send them into the promised land, even to give them success in the promised land. But he says in no uncertain terms, but I will not go with you. Because if I am in the midst of my people as a holy God amongst this sinful people, I will have to destroy them. There is no other way. So I will not go. And Moses, on both occasions, Moses begs God to relent. And this is key. He begs, not on the basis of God's mercy and grace. He begs on the basis of God's promise. Why? Because merciful and gracious is not yet who God has revealed himself to be. God's hinted at it. But up to this point, God has never said to his people, you wanna know my heart, here it is. And so when God doesn't just relent, but says, I will go with my people, and I will be their God, and they will be my people, and I will bring them into the promised land, and I will dwell in their midst, and I will show them my favor. When God shows this immense, incredible grace and compassion, Moses, as one who has never seen God in this way, Moses goes, God, show me more. Verse 18, chapter 33, show me your glory. And this is God's response. Verse 19, I will make all not my greatness, I will make my goodness. I will make my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and show mercy to whom I will show mercy. But, and this is the key for John 1, you cannot see my face. For man shall not see me and live. God says, here's what I'm gonna do, Moses. I'm going to put you in the cleft of a rock and I'm going to cover you with my hand and all of my glory is going to pass in front of you and you will hear who I am, the essence of my being proclaimed. And when my glory has passed by, I will remove my hand and what you will see it will not be my face, it will be my back. The afterglow of my glory. And when the moment comes and Moses is hidden behind the hand of God, God speaks to Moses the word of his revelation. He says, here's who I am. Exodus 34, verses six and seven. The Lord, the Lord. A God merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Who is God? God says to Moses, you can't see my face, but here's who I am. I'm the one for whom wrath is strange and mercy is natural. I'm not a stern disciplinarian who delights in beating his people. I'm a gracious father who revels in compassion and forgiving those who have done nothing to deserve such forgiveness. The glory, the glory of God, it's his goodness. It's his co 
goodness. His glory is his presence in the midst of his people to save. And yet right here, in the moment when God proclaims who he is, there is this riddle that's not answered. Because how? How is the holy God who if he dwells among his people will destroy them? How is he going to dwell in his people and bless them? How is the God who can by no means clear the guilty somehow going to forgive iniquity and sin and transgression? How are God's mercy and God's justice to somehow meet? And Moses, he isn't given the answer, but John says, we know what that answer is now. Because the one to whom the whole Old Testament points, that one has come. One where what Moses only heard we have now seen his glory. What God revealed to Moses, he has now revealed in full, in and through Jesus Christ. And the face of God that Moses couldn't see, it is the one that we now see in him. He says in verse 14, the word, the word that was in the beginning, meaning it has existed for all of eternity. The word that was with God, implying there is some distinction here. That word was God, implying union. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John John couldn't have said a more shocking statement if he had tried. You know, John could have expressed himself in any number of ways here. He could have said that the word became man. He could have used the Greek word anthropos, a word he used earlier in verse six in reference to John. He said there was a man, anthropos, named John. He could have said that. But John, instead, he chooses another Greek word, this Greek word sarx, a word that implies the whole of our humanity, all of its weakness and mortality apart from sin, a word that would have been startling to Jews and offensive to Greeks. Because for Jews, flesh was the thing that separated the human from the divine. God was spirit and man was flesh, and there was an infinite gap between those two things. For the Greeks, the flesh That wasn't something to be admired or loved. That was something to be escaped from. It was a prison from which you needed release. In five words, John just blows up everything. The infinite gap between God and man has now been bridged. God who is spirit has now become flesh. And the flesh, that thing that the Greeks think you need to escape from, God says, no, in fact, it is something that I love and I intend to redeem. The word That as Isaiah says, endures forever, the word became the flesh that is like grass that withers and the flower that fades. And yet, and here's the mystery, in becoming flesh, the word did not cease to be the word. God became man and in no way ceased to be God. You know, there, there is no human analogy that can possibly convey the depths of that. But I'll give you the closest one I got, and it's imperfect, so please don't stretch this. When I, Caleb Click, became a father, I didn't cease to be Caleb Click. The same guy, with all the same baggage and all the same history, all the same relationships, the same passions and desires, that man assumed something new but did not cease to be what he once was. John, John says that's what we're seeing here in the word that became flesh. And you see it in the text. He says the word became flesh. He never says it ceases to become the word. And to make that really clear, he keeps on going. He says it came and he dwelt among us. The language here is literally, it's the language of templing or tabernacling which if you remember your Old Testament, what is the temple and what is the tabernacle? It's the place where God dwelt. 
the temple has now found its fulfillment in this person. And we have seen, John says, speaking to the apostles, we have seen him, his glory, which again, what is glory always speaking of in the Bible? It's not man, who is it? It's the one whose glory descended on Sinai. It is the Lord, the one whose glory filled the very temple that is now walking around and talking to people. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only unique son from the Father, full of grace and truth. He's saying, very simply, to see Jesus is to see God. Uh, you know, when I was in college, my, my dad would come up and visit from time to time. And this would happen 10 out of 10 times. People that had never met me and my father, or maybe that knew me but didn't know my father, uh, they would see my dad walk in the room and they would immediately look at him and then look at me, and then they would look back and they would look again and they would go, oh, that's your dad, because you're a spitting image. You're 30 years younger and with a little more hair, but that's you. You look exactly like your dad. And this is true of, of all children with their parents, isn't it? To some degree, we reflect who our parents are and were. We carry their DNA. No matter whether we like it or not, it's just what it is. And what was true there, John says, it's even truer here, with some massive differences. Because we're, my father and I, we became father and son in space and time and history. I.e., there was a moment when my father was not my father and I was not his son. The relationship we're speaking here, this is one that has no beginning and has no end. God the Son and God the Father, they have eternally been God the Son and God the Father. The Word was in the beginning and the Word was with God and the Word was God. They have never ceased to be that in relationship to each other. But not only that, where my father and I, we reflect each other in some pale way through our physical appearance, if you get to know me and my dad, as some of you know my dad pretty well, we are not the same, are we? We have a lot of different likes. And as my high school years loudly proclaim, we have very different wills. Not here. The word was with God. The word was God. Why can you see the glory of the Father in the unique only Son, of whom there's only one? Why? Because as Hebrews 1-2 says, this Son is the exact imprint of his nature. They share the same substance. They share the same will. Equal in power and in glory. And to see the one is to see the other. And John, verse eight, in 1 verse 18, he makes this even more clear. He says, no one's ever seen God. Not even Moses. The only God who was with the Father, meaning who's the only God? That's the Son. He has made him known. You want me to sum this up in one sentence? Here it is. While remaining God and becoming man in a way where there is no mixing of the two, but the two natures are distinct, there is such a union between those two natures in the person of Jesus Christ that when you see the man, you are seeing God himself. Let the implications of that wash over you for a second. Do you want to know what it would be like to stand in the presence of God? Look at what it was like for the people who stood in the presence of Jesus. Do you want to know what God feels about the brokenness of this world and its pain and its sorrow? Look at the tears of Jesus by the tomb of Lazarus. And the compassion of Jesus when he sees a crowd that's like sheep without a shepherd. Do you want to know what kind of people God welcomes? Look at the kind of people that Jesus welcomes. It's not the people at the top of the ladder. It's the ones at the very bottom. The tax collectors and the prostitutes and children. As Jesus says 
in John 14, whoever has seen me, he has seen the Father also. Every breath, every step, it is the revelation of God in space and time and history in and through Jesus Christ. And what is it that is revealed? God's glory is once again his goodness. Because who is Jesus? He is the one who is full of grace and truth. You know, we might miss this because we're moving between languages here. But when John says Jesus is full of grace and truth, he's saying the same thing God did back in Exodus 34, that God is abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. The difference is this, where Moses heard the word of God's grace and truth, in Jesus, grace and truth has put on flesh, and grace and truth now has a face, and grace and truth can now be seen and not only can grace and truth be seen, but through him, grace and truth can actually be experienced and shared. Look at verses 16 to 17. For from his fullness, the fullness of his grace and truth, we have all, those who come by faith, received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, and it was good. But grace and truth, they have come through Jesus Christ. Why did God send the Son? And why did the Son decide to come? So that from his fullness, we would all receive grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. Because right here, in the person where the face of God is finally seen, the riddle of God is also finally solved. Because how is it that God would on the one hand be merciful and gracious, and yet at the same time be the one who in his holiness and justice could by no means clear the guilty? How was God going to dwell in the midst of his people and bless them if he is a holy God and they are a sinful people? How are justice and mercy finally going to meet? And John says, here in Jesus, we finally see the answer. In the place where his glory is most clearly seen and yet, as human beings, we are least likely to look. You don't want to know where Jesus' glory is in his own words, is seen most evidently. It's not in his miracles. It's not in his healings. It's not in his sermons. It's not in the resurrection. In John 12, Jesus says, it is in the place where the word that became flesh breathes its last. It's in the death of the poor Galilean carpenter on a blood-stained piece of wood on top of a hill that smelled like excrement and was filled with the groans of the dying and the taunts of the wicked. Because that is the place. That is the place where the justice and the mercy of God meet and the full character of the God who revealed himself through a word in Exodus 34, six to seven, has now revealed himself in human flesh. Because what does the scripture teach us? All have sinned, and the wages of that sin, just as God told Adam it would be, the wages of that sin is death. Which means if God is gonna be true, and God is going to be just, then man, man must die. And what has God in his mercy now done? God became man. So that as a man, though without sin, he could stand in the place of men and die the death that they deserve to die 
but who by remaining God is actually able to pay that debt in full so that we would never need to fear God's judgment again. As it says in 1 John 2, 2, Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. The glory of God. What is it once again? It's his goodness. I don't think John ever got over the shock of this. And you read through his gospel and his epistles and you get the sense of a man who is still in holy awe at what he experienced. As he says in the first chapter of 1 John, my, my eyes have seen, my ears have heard, my hands have literally touched the word of life. In his gospel, John is saying to you, I broke bread with God. I, I stood around the campfire and ate fish with God. I walked along dusty roads and I had conversations with God. I laughed with him. I sinned in his presence and he didn't reject me even though he did rebuke me. And his response to me, to my sin, to my brokenness, to my failure, it was as the Lord of glory to get down on his hands and on his knees and to wash my feet like a servant. And in the last meal that I ate with him, he let me put my head on his chest. A level of intimacy that is nowhere else mentioned in the book of John except for in one place. The son, in verse 18, who was at the father's side. As the son puts his head on the father's chest, so too does John put his head on Jesus. That's the level of connectedness they have. And he says, I have seen him die. And I have seen him raised. And I'm writing this to you, not just because I want you to hear my experience, but because I want you to experience it too. He says, I'm writing these things to you so that you may believe, and in believing you may have eternal life. God has made himself known. The life we were created for, the life that we lost because of sin. It is life that God, through Jesus Christ, restores and offers in full so that from his fullness, we would receive grace upon grace. Christianity, it's not a culture to be put on. It's not a system to be adopted. Christianity is a person to be believed into. Christianity is Jesus Christ. The glory of God revealed, and what is that glory? It's his goodness. To all who come to him by faith. Praise the Father who sent him. Praise the Son who came. And praise the Spirit who applies his work to us. Amen. Gracious Father, would you meet with us now as your people? Lord, you take our hearts, and Lord, where there is darkness, where, Lord, maybe we have been blind to you, Lord, would you open, open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts wide to you? And Lord, would we leave, not in our own hands, but in yours, as those who have seen life, and not just seen it, but experienced it, through the word who became flesh and dwelt among us, amen. You've been listening to the Perimeter Church Sermon Podcast. Perimeter Church is located at the corner of Highway 141 and Old Alabama Road in Johns Creek, Georgia. Please visit our website at www.perimeter.org for more information, to give us your feedback, and to find other sermons from our teaching team. Thanks for making this podcast a part of your day.